Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mini Spotlight here on AfterBuzz TV, where we interview Hollywood's rising talent. Today, I'm interviewing fellow Midwesterner Zach Avery. He's an up-and-comer, and I'm very excited to get into it right after this. You're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mini Spotlight on here on AfterBuzz TV. As I mentioned at the top, this is the show where we interview Hollywood's hottest up-and-coming talent. And today, I'm very excited to be interviewing Zach Avery. Zach, hello. Hello, how are you? I'm great. It's good to have you here in studio. Guys, my name is Jeff Graham. You've seen me on some other AfterBuzz shows here, but I don't do this series as often as I'd like, so I'm very excited to be here chatting with you today, Zach. As I mentioned at the top, we're fellow Midwesterners. Yes, definitely. From the land of the corn. Yeah, Exactly. How do you feel like the uh, L.A. experience has been for you versus the Midwestern experience overall? Look, it's, it's totally different, you know, mm -hmm. as you know. And I think there's positive and negative both. But, you know, for me, being here, being kind of having that creative juice and wanting to get it out, it's, it's the place to be over, over good old Indiana. You have to be. I feel like especially for TV film, there's just really nowhere else to be. It's true. You know, it's either here in New York, but still New York's a whole different vibe. You know, you get the Broadway stuff and things mm -hmm. like that. But here's... You got to be here to do it. Well, you did do some live theater in your pre-TV film career, which I was reading about. Yeah. Interestingly, Zach actually had a kind of burgeoning career in football, um, which was derailed. It was. <laughs> um, for the better, you could argue now yeah. for this uh, career. But I don't feel like that Venn diagram usually overlaps of like the alpha culture of football totally. with the not always stereotypically alpha culture of performing. Yeah. What was that experience like for you? So for me, it, w it was definitely like a split brain situation where I had always grown up with sports. I had always played sports and I always had the passion to kind of perform and, and be in the arts and put on plays and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of find my footing in both sides. You know, the stereotypical jock situation, like you said, isn't really conducive to then doing Shakespeare, or whatever mm -hmm. these types of plays. But what I did is I kind of took that alternative route and said, look, I love playing sports. It gets that kind of, you know, competitive energy out. But I also love this artistic side and I'm going to do both. And once people kind of realize that you just have to own it and you're going to do your thing, then they start, you know, appreciating you for that and you, you go for it. So did you know, I want to move to L.A. specifically, or do you feel like you were acting and performing in theater and then eventually you caught the bug? I think for me, it was always in the back of my head. You know, mm -hmm. I, I always knew that, you know, L.A. was kind of like the dream that eventually I'm going to go out there once I kind of get X, Y or Z done. Well, at the time, I didn't even know what X, Y or Z was. It just felt like I'm not ready and no one around me is telling me that you should go out there. So I need to do some stuff before that. But once I started doing, you know, some of the theater things and getting that kind of that angst out, it was clear. It was like, I have to go and I have to do it. And mm -hmm. we did. Well, we were talking before you we went live about your journey in LA. Every actor's journey is different. Everyone mm -hmm. is unique. But I'd say yours has been kind of the standard grinding, booking what you can until eventually we'll get to it. But you're yeah. booking a lot more uh, narratively contributing parts, totally. which is great to talk about. But what was that initial grind like where, you know, it takes, it can take up to a decade of playing oh, yeah. cop number two and uh, murder victim number three laying there with blood all over. <laughs> exactly. So how do you, you know, push through that grind and continue to know that the long game goal is what matters here? Yeah, you know, like when you when moving out here, my girlfriend at the time now, wife, you know, we, we drove across country. You mm -hmm. know, it was one of those things that we said, hey, we're just going to pack up and do it. So when we got here, there really wasn't much. We didn't know anyone. So that grind went on for at least three or four years of really knocking on doors, meeting everyone you could possibly meet doing anything possible, whether it was industrial stuff or lying on the ground and being <laughs> the dead person, whatever it may be, and coming out of college and being kind of that football-esque feel just physically, I was getting the standard things. You know, it was always cop, military, that sort of role. And so, you know, it, it took a lot of kind of saying, okay, I'm here, I'm getting something, at least I'm getting, you know, experience on set, which is huge. Now, mm -hmm. looking back in hindsight, all those little roles helped now that I'm actually doing things that I want to do because you just learn the mechanics and the and the kind of hierarchy of how a set is yeah. run and works and you need to know that stuff. Definitely, it's it's a different world, it's a different language. Mm -hmm. And if you were to get thrown into you know a leading part in a film, you wouldn't know what it means when someone says you know sound speeds. You, you, all of a sudden, you're confused. Totally. And so a lot of our listeners are sort of the up and comers. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like advice for someone who's you know in year five and they feel like they're not booking? What kind of advice would you offer them? 
I would say, at least from my uh, personal perspective, that, you know, for me, it helped a lot making personal connections outside mm. of the actual auditions that you're going in. So whether you're at a party or you're at some friends get together, whatever it may be, there's people in the industry that you may not even know are casting directors or producers or directors that if they get to know you as a person and they know, yeah, you're an actor, but you're not just trying to climb the ladder, they may think of you for other things. So I would say, look, you're going to knock on a thousand doors. You're going to go to a thousand auditions and you might hear no all the time, but you never know that connection you may mm -hmm. make in there. That's going to lead to something down the road. It's a great point because the truth is everyone in LA is talented, right? For sure. So if I'm a director and I have two very talented people, but I like one of them more as a person, exactly. I'm definitely going to pick that person For sure. because at the end of the day, after you call cut, you're still working with that person. Exactly. So, And that's the biggest piece is that when you get on these movie sets or TV sets, you're really this kind of tight-knit family for weeks, if not months mm. at a time. So you have to want to be around these people. And so you have to think of them, yes, they're talented and they bring X, Y, or Z to the table, but I also want to hang out with them outside of that. Even if it's 3 in the morning. Even if it's 5 in the morning. Exactly. <laughs> Production, man, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, it's been very exciting because the last couple of years you've had a real big jump in your career. Sure. There's three projects specifically I'm super excited to talk about. The White Crow um, was directed by Ray Fiennes. Yes. I think he, I mean, obviously he's one of the most talented, but as it, he was directing you in this case. Directing. So yeah. can you talk about, two-part question, what's Ray Fiennes like? Because mm -hmm. from a distance, I admire him a lot. Totally. And what was he like as a director, and how did sort of his actor influences uh, contribute to his directing style? For sure. So first of all, he's he's incredible. You know, he's a type of person that I rarely have met so far that... You just are in his presence, you feel something. Mm. There's something tangible there that you're kind of like, this is different than normal people. Um, in terms of his directing style, it's very personal. So, and I think he brings kind of his acting experience with that, that he knows there's certain things that you can tell an actor that will help a performance over just like, hey, maybe you're a little more sad here, or mm. bring it back to a certain like emotional standpoint. He says things that are technical sometimes of even, hey, I loved what you did there, bring exactly the same thing. But if you turn just a little bit to the right, the light's going to hit you in a way that's going to look amazing. Mm. And it's going to bring the emotion out of you without changing much of the performance. Those little things you only learn by being in the moment mm. and being great and doing that sort of thing. So I think it was that with also, I mean, he's just one of the most passionate people I've ever met. So, you know, you can't get around it. He's so... His characters tend to be so villainous. I yeah. mean, he's played two of the most iconic villains in totally. film history. Totally. Is he a nice guy? He he really is. Like, that's <laughs> the weird thing, is that you kind of have all of this built-up angst and built-up preconceived notions about what he's going to be like, what's it going to be. You know, and I'm, I'm shooting in Serbia, so we're going out to Belgrade, Serbia. I show up the first day that I'm supposed to be there, walk on set. He's in the back of this auditorium, and he's, Zach! Oh, that's you know? awesome. And again, it's like, I'm not the star of this film. Right. I'm, I'm a guy coming in, doing my part. But he makes it personal. He's really, he's there, and you, you feel like he's there for you, and he wants the best out of you. I love that. So, no, it was really cool. Well, let's talk about Last Moment of Clarity. Very, very exciting film, particularly working with Samira Weaving. Yeah. Um, she's had a couple big announcements coming totally. up. Totally, yeah, no, she's incredible. It, mm -hmm. was, it was one of those things that I had done White Crow, and then I did a film called Farming, and it was one of the same producers that was doing Last Moment of Clarity. And he's like, look... I have this role. It's a really cool, like, layered piece. I think you'd be great for it. Start growing your beard now and go for <laughs> it. So I started growing this crazy beard, went in and read for James and Colin Chrysler, who directed it, and it just turned into a really beautiful piece. And Samara was incredible. You know, she pe played my fiancé in the movie. Basically, you see through Sam's eyes, my character, that he witnesses her murder and kind of flees to Paris, and he's in this horrible place, watches a movie, and it looks exactly like her in this weird way. Wow. And he goes on this journey to figure out, is it her, is it not her? If it is, is true love really going to last, or is it only in a time and a place? And so by being able to play opposite such an incredible actress as her, it really allowed for so many layers and, and kind of a good experience. It was great. I appreciate you. I said Samira Weaving. I think I combined Samira Wiley hey, and Samara Weaving. I'm sure she gets it all the time, and she just goes by Sam, so nice. Sam works as well. Well, Sam, I just want you to know if you're watching this, I love you as an actress, and I apologize for the mispronunciation of your name. No um, Gateway, yeah. Olivia Munn. Olivia all Munn. This amazing talent. I'm it sure, really, I mean... Do you feel like not only working with talent, do you just feel like it forces you to up your game it does. immediately? It completely yeah. elevates every single thing you're mm -hmm. doing, because you know... You can't just kind of phone it in and well, they'll they'll call you out and you can tell the difference when you're acting op opposite a really like masterful actor mm -hmm. or actress. 
they are doing their thing, which is incredible no matter what. So if you're just there kind of doing whatever, it's not going to work no, uh, on either side. So it was great. What's the biggest lesson you learned from Olivia Munn? I think Olivia is, is about not taking yourself in the role too seriously. So she was playing a very, you know, a, a very deep character, you know, single mother, my character had been in prison. So she's been dealing a lot with a lot, but in life there's highs and lows. Even if you're in a horrible situation, sometimes you're laughing. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're finding a situation funny that really on the nose is not necessarily funny. And a lot of times when you come in, the first instinct when you read a hard scene is to say, oh, I'm gonna go brooding and go dark. And she was like, oh, play opposite. You know, see mm. what happens when you play opposite. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but let's figure out a space in between there that does. And it's those kind of, you know, you know, lessons, I guess you would say, that I'll take with me forever. Well, I was reading early in your days in Chicago, you were interested in comedy. Yeah. And it seems like lately you've been getting booked for these really <laughs> brooding roles. Would you want to play some comedy in the future? I think I would do anything. You yeah. know, it's one of those things that I think the, the line between comedy and a dramatic piece or even a horror piece is pretty thin. Mm. It's just... You know, it, it's about one of those situations when in the real life, right, you either cry or you laugh. I think that's kind of the line. And hmm. for me, I'm, I'm totally down to do anything. I think I'm not a, a like, joke type of comedy, but physical comedy, I, I love. I love that. Yeah. Favorite movie you've seen this year or in the last year? I would say, um, I mean, I just saw Rocket Man, so that's, like, at the at the right in the front of my brain, which movie. I loved. Um, I, weirdly, I'm on this music thing. I love Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm -hmm. Um... I would go with Bohemian Rhapsody. I really, really thought his performance was incredible. He that. killed it. Yeah. Rami was great. Yeah. Uh, last show you binge watched? Last show I binge watched was probably. Um, oh my God, I'm blanking right now. What You've been was, working. So I know, busy. I know. What was the. I mean. Game of Thrones, honestly. Like of that course. was That, that was counts. probably the, the last one. My wife and I don't watch Game of Thrones. Oh, man. I it's... think I'm the only person in L.A. who doesn't watch Game of Thrones. So here's the thing. is I ha I didn't watch the first five seasons at all, mm -hmm. and everyone, you got to watch, you got to watch it. And I was shooting something, so I had downtime while I was there. And my wife and I watched season one through five in like three weeks. Yeah. So. I, we know that's going to happen, yeah. and we don't want to get sucked into the vortex yet. Yeah. We're going to find a time that works better in our life when we can get lost in For Westeros. Sure. Is that right? Y yes, it is. Well, there's lots of different ones, but Westeros that's one is of, one um, of them. Yes. All right. That shows how much I know about the show. Yeah. Um, you're going to Spain in a week, you said? Uh, in the beginning of July, so about a month. About a month. Yeah. Okay, what's that for, and so what can we expect? It's for it's a film called American Carnage, a uh, director named Diego Halavez is directing it. Really cool. Him and his brother are the hell of his brothers. They're mm. Mexican producer directors. And it's, I can't talk too much about the storyline, but it's a really cool kind of timely political thriller that cool. it will be, it will be excited. I'm, I'm really excited to go out there. Well, at the risk of sounding like I'm generalizing, there seems to be a very powerful streak of talented Mexican filmmakers 100%. lately. If you look at the Oscars, Inaritu, mm -hmm. uh, Cuaron, totally. they, all three, and of course Del Toro, they just keep handing Oscars back and I forth know. to each other. So it's a good time to be directed by Mexican That's talent, for I sure. think. That's for sure. It's very exciting. Anything else we can be looking out for in the meantime? Um, I think so. Coming out July 12th, actually, is a film. It was called Hell's Where the Home Is when it did its kind of premiere circuit last year. Mm -hmm. And now it's coming out. Uh, it will be called Trespassers. That's released theatrically on July 12th. And then Last Moment of Clarity will be out later this year. So awesome. We'll see. That's really exciting. Last thing I always ask my interviewees is if you could tell your 10 years ago self one thing, what would that be? I would say trust your gut. Mm. That normally the feelings I felt when I was introduced to a project or thought maybe this wasn't for me, but I did it because I felt like it's work and I might as well do it. Usually I was correct in Great. either passing or taking it. I love that. Well, Zach, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I wish much. we had more time. I feel like I could chat your ear off for hours. I don't know. But yeah, next time. We'll do it next again. Next time. Next time you're winning your Oscar, please remember After Buzz, and we'll bring you in, Zach. <laughs> there we go. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to Mini Spotlight. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, my name is Jeff Graham. If you want to catch me doing other things here at the network, I do some after shows. Uh, I do host the after show for The Bachelorette, so if you've ever seen that show. There we go. It's very, the tea was very hot last week, so yeah. <laughs> uh, it's going to keep getting, keep ramping up. If you want to tune into that, that's Monday nights at 7 p.m. And uh, where can they find you on social if they want to connect with you, Zach? Um, Instagram's underscore Zach Avery, Z-A-C-H-A-V-E-R-Y. You got it. I'm surprised. It's hard. I feel like, so my name's Jeff Graham. Mm-hmm. A lot of Jeff Grahams on Instagram, yeah. but you nailed down the Zach Avery. I nailed down the Zach Avery. That's yeah, huge. So it's great. It. <laughs> there you go. Well, you can find him there, guys, and you can find me at Jeffrey C. Graham on Twitter. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.
Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> the views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal.